strong point, so you can have a weak point. Will your weak point ever be your strong point? 80% of the time, no. I mean, I just like to lie to you and tell you, yeah, if you work real hard, boy, you're going to get there. And the reality is that's not the truth any more than, you know, your parents telling you when you're 5'3 that you can, you know, be an offensive lineman if you work hard. The message is real cool, and you do want to work as hard as you can. Again, playing the hand you dealt. You want to get as big as you can, you want to balance your physique out the best you can, especially if you're going to compete. Everybody, everybody should go that route they want to without being, and everybody's going to be filled, and everybody's going to be perfect, and, and balanced, and go on to nationals and your pro card. But you can still do a lot with what you have. You may still end up with those weak points, but you'll still progress. They'll still get better. I was born with terrible chest, and I still get terrible chest. It's just better than it was before. But it's not going to respond as good as other muscles. So before I move on, anything else with any training or anything that, that strikes you guys? And I'm good. I mean, like I said, if you have questions, I'll, I'll take the point. It doesn't really matter. variables that you have to take into consideration. Um, so that's a good question. It, it's so individual that you do have to look at those things. Am I getting a lot of sleep? Do I have a stressful job? Um, am I, you know, I get competitors who are like ER nurses. Way more stressful than me working on my computer in my office at home every day. I don't even deal with traffic. So all those things have to be taken into consideration to, as far as whether you're going to recover well or not even down to supplementation and how efficient your nutrition is and things like that too. How long you've been training, how high your volume is, how frequently you're training. Uh, so I, I give, this is, a, this is one of those questions that the answer is more of an opinion than anything else because it really isn't a right or wrong answer. If you're going to train, say, say full body, okay, you can do that and you can do that three or four times a week. But the volume has to be so low that you're able to recover, you know, from almost from workout to workout. I say that it's better to split up the muscle groups over the course of a week, five days. But then again, you know, the more you split it up, you only hit a muscle group once a week and hit it with a higher amount of volume because it's it's going to take a while before you come back around to it, so you've got time to recover. So you also got to take into consideration your nervous system and whether you have that. You know, if you're going to train six days a week and you're going to train, you know, chest one day, biceps the next day, you're still training for six days. So, my opinion, I always say this, and 90% of the time, there's always exceptions, but you want to rest more than you train. So, if you train three days a week and you rest four, that's a pretty good balance. Now, people will say, well, wait, I'm long, I'm far, you know, further than three days a week, because it seems very basic. But you shouldn't really approach it that way because I've got high level amateur bodybuilders, um, you know, professional athletes that can not only even just not only train in the off season for growth on three days a week very effectively, but even guys getting ready for shows. So it's harder when you get ready for shows because you're gonna be when it gets closer to the show and you're dieting to lose a lot of body fat, then you do tend to run out of gas sooner. So it is sometimes better to train with less volume or less muscle groups in that session and then spread it out over more days. But I say by and large, you should rest more than you. If you have a great recoverability, bump it to four, come back to three. But I mean, once you start getting over four days a week, that's a lot of training and it's not a lot of recovery. My opinion. Yeah? No, no, no. Just picking up on, on your rest theme. Let's say you're working three three times a week and the question really is um, do you rest more by doing um, let's say you're doing four different kind of exercises and instead of doing um, all the reps, 80 reps, you rest, well let's say you normally do let's say 15 or 20 depending on what you're doing and then you rest for two three minutes and then you do 15 20 and you repeat that four or five times 
as opposed to splitting up those exercises and going a circuit so that you're integrating different exercises and so that essentially you're resting one muscle while you're exercising the other, you're coming back around on a circuit. Gotcha. Um, we're, that's a different type of rest than what I'm referring to with his question. Um, I say the rest between sets doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the sense that the work is still being done. Um, and you have, you have two ways to look at it. The longer you rest, the stronger you're going to be. You're not going to be as fatigued when you come back to it and hit it again. Um, but at the same time, the other side of it too is, is the faster you go in between sets, you may not be as strong, but the intensity will be higher. So which one matters? I didn't even want to answer it, but you know. I mean, and the reason I say that is because it's anybody's guess. And, and that's where it comes back to, let's say you've been doing it one way for a while, and you've got that strength. Strength is always important, but it's not, in my opinion, it's not the last, it's not the only thing to cause you, you know, Anybody who knows DC training or that type of training will tell you, you just broke that command I'm calling Dante right now and letting him know that you know, just said that. Because it, it's it's a cardinal, I mean, you know, that's like a cardinal rule for DC training. You have to progress. So with that progression, here's my question. We were talking about it in the car on the way down here. If you have, if you did 200 pounds for 12 reps last time, then you got to come in and you got to do 220 with 12 reps, so you got to do you know, 200 for 15 reps. So you get under it, and the only thing that matters is you get more reps or you get more weight. So what do those reps look like? Maybe I'm just gonna make them a little faster. Maybe I'm gonna, I mean, when you're, when you're only focused on that number and you're only focused on, I gotta move this so many times, a lot of other things get thrown, you know, the efficiency of that set, in my opinion, is gonna be compromised for most people. I might look at it because I've been trained so long, okay, I got to beat these numbers, but I've got to work hard to not just increase the speed and bang or even shorten the range of motion. There's a lot of ways to get different numbers. So you really have to look at it and go, okay, is the strength the most important thing? I don't think that it is. I think there are some times where I just won't even pay attention to my reps as long as they're higher than six or seven, and especially with calves, you know, something that you just, you just have to destroy to get to grow. You might as well just not count, and you know, people say, how do you train legs? You don't count, you go full range of motion. This is all you gotta do to train calves, really, to get good calves. You gotta not count reps, you gotta go full range of motion, and you have to tolerate as much pain as you can humanly tolerate, shake your calves off for 15, 20 seconds, and go back at it again. And then you need to do that for about 10 years because that's how long it's going to take to get good calves. I laugh. When I started training in the 80s, calves mattered. And I had chicken legs. I broke my ass to get the calves I did. And when I finally got them, they didn't even matter anymore. Because in the 90s, you didn't have to have them anymore. Seriously, you couldn't. Tony Pearson couldn't win a show in the 80s. Not that he was going to win the Olympia, but he wasn't winning some shows because his calves were so bad. And then you come up with guys in the 90s that, that it's just so painfully obvious that they're in balance and it doesn't matter anymore. So I didn't mean to get off on the calf tangent, but the point being, it's two different rests. That, the circuit training versus, I don't think it's going to build muscle as much. If, if, if that's more the question, a circuit training type. Well, circuit training to me is using the muscle and burning more calories because it's kind of more non-stop, that sort of thing. There's a little bit more. Clearly, it's not just burning body fat because glycogen is still the fuel choice. You're still getting the pump, you know, that sort of thing. But it's still more of a, it's less of a strength, less of a size. You ain't going to get huge that way. Now, that doesn't mean that you want to get huge. Don't get me wrong. If you want to be in great shape and you want to burn more calories and say so you don't have a lot of time to do extra cardio, that's part of, that's a great way to train. It's a great especially, way to train. Especially when you're thinking ahead at age 75 and you say, well, maybe I didn't want so much bulk after all. Right, that could be too, yeah. But you can always just, like I said, you can go to the sandals for a week and you can eat a lot of food. <laughs> and you'll be fine. You can see that in like, uh, CrossFit type of training. Yeah. That's more basically on the strength. 
usually when I see clients see that stuff and they see the person how they love you, they're assuming it, it is automatically auto and do more and make a bench press this and that and all that. And, and the concept that they see is like, does that make you the muscle or is it just a strength thing all around? CrossFit is tough. Here's the thing: it's it's getting harder and harder for the average person to look at somebody and decide what they want and how to train, because because someone looks a certain way and they train a certain way doesn't mean that that's how they got there. Yeah. You know, it's weird because I have bodybuilder guys I've competed against for years who are now CrossFitters and I have to give them a hard time, but they look great. I mean, the joke it's it's kind of funny because they stay lean all the time. It's in incredible condition all the time. They're actually winning. Oh, and if they're not winning, you're going top three in every competition they do because it's easier to go from a bodybuilder with the strength down to and gain the cardiovascular and the oxygen uptake than it is to go the other way and be that skinnier guy who has the running and has the cardio and then get the strength out of it. But it is hard because now there's so many divisions. I mean, you got men's physique, you got uh, you know the CrossFit thing that is just. I don't know if it's blown up here, but it's blown up in the United States. Right? Huge. Uh, and it's a good look. I mean, I look at it and go, dang, I don't know if I had a smaller waist like that, maybe I'd down with that too. So it is. It's kind of a, appealing, you know. You get the body where you start eating more food, your waist getting bigger. You got to wonder, I gained four inches on my chest and shoulders, but I gained two and a half on my abs. You know, they may be muscular, but you're a little lockier from eating all that food. So it's, you know, sometimes it can be a catch there. Um, you know, it's. I think again, it just comes back to: Do you know where that person that you see and you like to look? Do you know where they came from? Was the training related to the progress they made? Maybe they're a CrossFitter because they look that way, and it's that training appeals to them more, and it fits how they look. You know, I don't mean to come at everything from the other side, but I like to, to well, shift the different. What I'm trying to say is, I, I did a piece of body thing. I was like. Okay. And rip and everybody's like, how do you do it? How do you do it? I mean, I have to make up a story about people out because I was moving like that. It's basically like, and you know, they just see me do a lot of things like crunches and acid, and they're like, oh, that's like that. What do you do? What do you need? All you do is right. party. But it's like trying to sell these things. I mean, the body part of the body is the most impressive. It doesn't fly that way. It's a visual thing. It doesn't fly from. It doesn't fly. It doesn't fly like us. Kind of being somebody that just walking to the gym. Gotcha. The clients say, okay, right, this is the right way to do it. Right. You know, they have to go around the wrong way. Yeah. You try every everything and every other move that you do. Maximum. Sure. These things here. And then, you yeah. know. Well, and one of the things of being a trainer, and whether you're a nutritionist, you're a trainer, or whatever else, that you get this. They'll come in and they'll talk to you and be like, um, well, Johnny said, I heard the other day, Johnny said that he did this. Well, you ain't paying Johnny. If you're working with Johnny, then go talk to Johnny. You know, you got to, your clients also have to know, and you don't have control over this, and it can be kind of frustrating as a trainer. The clients have to listen to you. They're paying you. You think they will listen to you, but they don't always do that. So it is. It can be tough. It can be frustrating. But number one rule is, I mean, you hand them the tools to go build a house, you don't know what the hell to do. You might go beat somebody over the head with You're not responsible for that. You know what I mean? You're trying to help them out. You're trying to get them to, to build on, in, in your hands with the tools, but you don't know what they're going to do. My client base is roughly 70% outside of the United States. I meet very few people. I mean, I worked with Shneek forever and finally just saw her face to face last night. Um, I rarely meet the people that I work with. So they think that I have no idea that they've stuffed their face with cake and everything else, and, but yet when they come back to me for the week and they tell me what they have done, it's just right there. It doesn't say that because I've been doing it for so long I can see. And I have to ask them, what the hell have you been doing? Because this doesn't happen without you doing some version of this. <laughs> this is like, like they think you're so far away that you just don't know. I'm not going to. And part of it is they're embarrassed. I get that. Okay, and you have to understand. I go over this with the training too. Whether you're a veteran or you're somebody starting out, it's not a game of being perfect. I mean, top. They won't tell you, but top competitors 
and I'll tell them. And they have to tell you, because I'll tell them. Bill was going through drive throughs when he turned pro. He couldn't stay out of the McDonald's drive through because he was, you know, in a sense, over-dieting, that sort of thing. And he was learning the ropes. I mean, the guy was so good that he was advancing so fast that he wasn't able to to really get the discipline right away of the dieting and everything else. And look, I say this, if the guy can turn pro going through McDonald's for a week, the more power to you, you eat the hell out of them quarter pounders and chicken like that turn to pro. But everybody else hates on it for that reason. You know, because they've been working their butt off and they've been around for a while and they're not doing it. Almost everybody getting ready for a show will fall off and they'll lose it. They'll just lose it. So, it's not about the perfection, it's about consistency. It's when you do fall off that you don't say, well, it's Tuesday, I'll start next Monday. It's Tuesday, dude. Get back on now. Jump back on. Get back on the plan and, and keep going. So, it, and it really does. It, it matters. I've got these it, it, stories. I've got stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I mean, uh, any other questions with Trent? Um, oh, wait, somebody didn't say yeah. <laughs> well, for, for me, it's all about habits. Um, what's your view or your take on habits? Because then for me, I, I had sick of it. I lost a lot of weight. Yeah. I say arms, back, traps, but abs will not show. Oh, okay. So, I'm not sure. Well, first thing is, is it a body fat issue, or do you not have thickness in your abdominal wall from a muscular standpoint? Like, is it a weakness from just a muscle standpoint? Yeah. yeah. So if that's the case, then, and, and here's what a lot of people do, they treat abs like, I have to do crunches 15 and 20 reps every day. If that's a weak muscle, you got to get it to grow. So you got to hit it like you would with the same type of idea or ideology of hitting chest or hitting back. It has to be heavier. And I'm not telling you to do 6, 8 reps. What I'm telling you is it's got to be heavier. It's got, you got to have resistance there. What happens a lot of times is you're either born with a real pretty abdominal wall that's shaped real well, or you're not. Now, it doesn't mean you can't do anything with it, you can't thicken it up and everything else, but a lot of, that's a very, um, genetics controls what your waistline looks like from a muscular standpoint quite a bit. And an example is I'm more of a rich Gaspari, blocky ab, you know, I can get super thin skin, veins and everything else, but I'm still blocky in my midsection where someone else may have more of that taper and it comes down real pretty and it's a small waist, that sort of thing. If it's, yeah, yeah, exactly, versus rich. Never mind that he could never be rich. <laughs> but, but your, and then it becomes, then from there it's a body fetish. I mean, you could probably get leaner, but again, if, you know, I tell this to people all the time when they don't want to get big, they just want to come to me and they're like 160 pounds. This is no offense against anybody 160 pounds. But if you're 160 pounds and you're 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and you want to get ripped, you don't have muscle to get ripped. That's like trying to carve a, a turkey that, that, that there's just nothing there. there you got to have meat to carve meat or get detail, that sort of thing. So. If it's an issue of thickness, then you just got to hit it. And the nice thing is that you cover relatively quick. Uh, so you could probably hit them two, maybe even three times a week, and hit them, hit them pretty hard. Not with things that put your back at risk, like a sit-up or something like that, but weighted rope crunches. Wait, I don't know what kind of machines you have here. And I'm not a big machine guy, but when it comes to abs, if it can save your back, you want to find a couple solid machines to train abs. That's that's my, that's my opinion. I'm not anti-machine, but at the same time, I think not enough people pick up weight and set it down. And that's just, if there's one thing that has been proven over time, that you're going to get big if you have to pick up weight and put it down. Machines, you know, they have their, their place, but you got to move real weight. In my opinion, you got to move real weight.
the I start working and doing on my shoulder because my shoulder is there. But the, the, the front part is stronger than your back part. Sure. Um, you need to get out of You're going to answer your own question though right here, aren't you? As soon as you said front, front part is stronger than your back part, get your back part too. There's the imbalance. And when you have injuries, a lot of times that's really what it is. In some way there's an imbalance somewhere and it's going to manifest. It's going to come up as an injury. It's the weak it's going to give some. Um, so first order of business really is then you have to wonder or ask yourself how much work are you doing front pressing and chest versus back, specifically high rows and things like that, middle, upper back. Um, a lot of times you can even see when people are, if people sit and they're kind of hunched forward, these muscles are tight and they're pulling everything forward. Now, you can have good posture, which you always want to try to stick your shoulders back. But you can catch, you know, it's almost like a gut. If you don't control your gut, then the thing comes out, and you got to wonder how strong your abs are, too. So, first order of business is just to take a look at your training, your back training versus your chest training. And most dudes, and I don't know that you do, most guys tend to favor, and they go more, you know, they got to put the numbers up, they got to bench. And I'm not a big man. I don't think benching is great right anyway, because I think it, it's number one injury, it's hard on the front shoulders, front delts, and not a lot of people truly bench correctly. Uh, but aside from that, um, if it's not that, and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case, but that's the first order of business if, you're, if you know you're already weak in the back. The other thing is what, just what exactly the injury is. And, and I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on the internet. I say that, I always say that, like, it's, like I'm joking, but the first number, when push comes to shove, I am a Bodybuilder who's been around for a long time who specializes in nutrition supplementation. There is no rehab in there. I don't pretend to be an expert in that area. The only reason, if I, if you come to me and you say, well, I've got a torn label, I'm like, oh, I've had to deal with that for 20 years. So there's a lot that I've had to deal with with clients and a lot I've had to deal with with myself for training so long that I may be able to relate. But I don't know specifically, like I say, if it's a rotator cuff, I have to have a lot of rotator cuff issues that I've had to deal with. And it's awful hard for me. I'm not dealing with clients one-on-one -on -one like you are. I'm dealing with them miles and miles away. And that's why I can do that because I'm not, the training advice and consulting that I'm giving is quite secondary to the nutrition and supplementation aspect of it. They'll get the training from me, but they're coming to me for the nutrition and supplementation. And the gap in space, you know, with them being somewhere, me being somewhere else, allows me to do that. The training, I mean, I. I tell my clients all the time, I can't diagnose what your situation is, and I'm like over the internet. So I tend to try not to give a whole lot of advice on that, if possible. Um, and me giving you the advice of saying that, it's, that you need to bring up the week, but that's more from a bodybuilding perspective than it is a medical diagnosis or, or a rehab type thing. Uh, can I ask though, what is the pain in it? How is it? It's one side, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's because if it's bowls, then it might not necessarily. No, no, it's the right arm. Yeah, the right arm. When you're doing, what, what are you doing? Oh, it's only bothering you when you're playing school or when you're training? When you're training. Okay, so what are you doing specifically? You're on top of the windows and the side. Okay, saddle. Saddle raise. The presses are fine. Okay. Um, and so here's what I would, cause in, and it sounds simple, and I don't mean it to, but anything that hurts, you don't do. I mean, that's, you, you know, and again, that comes back to people thinking, well, but I have to do this because it's part of the shoulder routine, or I have to squat because it's part of my leg. You don't. Anything that hurts you, just, if you can work around it, work around it, especially with a multi-angle joint like your shoulder, which is nice because, um, because I've had torn uh, cartilage forever, the torn labor on my shoulder, there are some days where I have to, I can do side laterals, but I have to lean into a an incline bench instead of stand up. So you can play with the angle too for your side laterals. A lot of times when people do side laterals, they tend to do this. So they're they're coming back and they're flipping, and a lot of that stress is transferring to the front part of the shoulder when we're all weaker from the back anyway. So if you're able to even stay in here and do your side lateral raises out this way, transferring. You're still working side down, but it's actually moving that stretch to the back part of the side delt instead of the front part of the side delt. Not only will you see your shoulders improve, but you may get around the pain completely.
because with that multi-angle joint, when you've got pain in there or irritation or it's a rotator cuff or some type of itis, I'd call that anything itis is old guy. Old guy, just hurt. So were you. Basically, you just used it so much, and then you ask him, when was the last time you took a day off? I don't know, maybe when I was 23. I trained all the time. Well, that's real hardcore of you. But you sometimes need to take that time because you just beat your body up and you get to the point where you've got a couple aches and pains. A few days, a handful of days, even a week, can make all the all the difference in the world. Come back and at least you can, I like to say my joints are all the time, except for that first week when I come back after I've taken a week off, I feel like a million bucks. And then it's back the second week to the same old crap. <laughs> Everything hurts again. So, you know, I mean, you really go with that and just play with that angle a little bit. I was thinking maybe you would say that it was a press behind your neck or something, some poor biomechanical, you know, like why would you press behind your neck? But, um, but that's a personal choice. I don't believe anything goes behind your neck ever. The next time you go to put a box on a shelf and you do it this way, then you can go back to your presses behind your neck. And that usually stops it right there. Or I tell people, if you're going to pull yourself up to look over something, and you're going to pull it up behind your neck like you do with a lap pole, then you can lap just behind your head. Point being, it's not a natural movement. So, yeah. Uh, does anybody, you guys, uh, drink, bathroom, break for a minute? I mean, I can talk forever. I can keep going. I can, I mean, if you guys want to break for a few minutes, keep going. I don't know. Hey, I've maybe uh, got somewhere to go. Maybe people want to hear you. Me, I'll write. Hey, I'll keep, I'll keep up. Um, this one's actually easy, cardio. Um, it sucks. It's a giant waste of time. And that's not a waste of time. You should be healthier to get lean. But it's incredibly boring. You go nowhere. Maybe here. Maybe in Jamaica. I live in Colorado. So I do. I live just outside of Denver and Mount. So for me to go outside at a higher elevation, it is pretty. But I'm not enjoying cardio. I don't know about you. Cardio just plain sucks. So my advice with cardio, even if it doesn't suck and you just love cardio and you really like it because you're just a little off, that's a loss. Uh, that's <laughs> off, man. Yeah, off, too. Oh, my goodness, two of them. Get together and train together. <laughs> um, even, even if you do like it, you know, we have so much time in the day. You got, you know, I'm sure y'all got jobs, you got kids and stuff you would probably rather be doing. So, again, it comes back to efficiency, and I use that word a lot with training. Efficiency. You don't want to be doing anything that you're wasting time on. Cardio is the same way. And my philosophy on cardio is very, very simple. Use it as a tool to keep your metabolism running hot, or you know, your body burning more calories, but don't let your body rely on it. If you don't compete, you know someone who has or who's lost a ton of weight and they are doing two hours of cardio a day and they're dying and they're probably not getting any further with two hours a day as they were even with one hour a day, but that's a whole other uh, discussion. Again, it's efficiency. Um, put the cardio in, take it out. You've heard of carb cycling, calorie cycling. Uh, your body will adapt if you eat the same amount of calories and you know, carbs and things like that. Your body will adapt to the same amount of cardio as well, so you got to kind of keep it off balance. My advice. If, if you're saying, well, what do you mean? How would I know when to put it and take it out? Start the week with your cardio, set for how many ever sessions that week. But if you're progressing well that week and your weight is falling like you want to, then cut a couple sessions out at the end of the week. You're not going to all of a sudden stop burning fat or stop losing weight. Um, it's, an, you know, it's a cumulative type thing. I've had people when, you know, especially during the show, I'll cut their cardio sometimes seven to ten days out and they freak. Like, I'm, I still have body fat to lose. I want to lose body fat. Um, you know, you don't just stop burning body fat the day that you stop doing cardio 